As you all remember, uh, Mr. Griglack works for the uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife as the uh, head of uh, Hunter's Education for the Northern Region of New Jersey. All right. So, Keith, you take it away. All right. Well, this is interesting. Trying to do something like this online, it's a lot easier and more fun if we actually had fish on our laps to to uh, actually dissect. Even more fun if we're able to go out there and catch them ourselves before we did some dissection to see what they're eating. <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate enough to go actually with one of my old professors on his boat on Saturday, and we had a very good day striper fishing. So I ended up keeping stripers, and we checked out their stomach contents. And then I've done a lot of other program talking about some other species of fish from different ecosystems and um yeah we'll go from there see how we do because you know looking at stomach contents of a fish there's various reasons why you might want to do that other than just for your merit badge um one you know why is it important as a fisheries manager to understand what the stomach contents are what the fish is eating why is this important to the consumer as uh, someone who wants to be eating that fish and why is this important to you as an angler so we'll go through step by step and see if we can answer some of these questions um, as we go. Come on, sir. Striped bass. Anybody out there ever catch a striped bass? Just raise your hand, and then Miss Kolesser, tell me if anyone has ever caught a striped bass. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not seeing any. Hand. Oh, wait. No. No. Okay. Here's just rubbing his head. Nope. I, I don't ah. see anybody out there who has caught a striped bass. Uh, so okay. Striped bass is a saltwater fish, right? It's saltwater, but it does breed in freshwater, so it's classified as an anadromous fish. And a very, very uh, exciting fish for the East Coast. It covers all the way from Maine all the way down to Peak, even a little further south of Chesapeake. And right now, there's a big migration north. And as they're doing that, there's also spawning migration up the big rivers. So uh, Delaware River has got a good run going on right now. Almost all the fish we catch in Raritan Bay are ones that are coming down from the Hudson River and a little bit from the Raritan River too. So right now we've got these really big bass that are just spawned out that are heading now north, heading up towards Cape Cod for the summer. Um, and we even have some that are actually still going up the rivers to spawn right now. So striped bass, they can eat just about anything that's not bigger than them. They, you know, so any given day something might work for fishing but if you could figure out what they're really keen in on it's something that you can really work with. so there's a striped bass probably about 28 29 inches long new jersey you're allowed one fish between 28 and 38 inches and you're allowed you have a special permit that you can keep one a little bit smaller 24 to 28 A lot of times the grass shrimp is what they're on. So that's all shrimp in there. That's a different fish. Yep. That's a different striped bass, 100% grass shrimp. And here's one just to show you about how they'll eat just about anything that swims. On the left, those are all pipefish, which is pretty much a fish that doesn't have any commercial value. The next fish over right here, that's a sea robin which um, anyone that's ever gone fluke fishing, you probably caught plenty of those. Then you see you got a bunch of crabs over here, and here are some big jumbo shrimp. So this same fish had a variety of food to eat. It wasn't just keyed in on one food source like the last two uh, stomachs we looked at. And you look, almost everything a striped bass eats, whether it's crabs, whether it's shrimp, whether it's here we got lobster, they're almost all commercially fished. So when you're trying to manage for striped bass, you're managing not just for the fish, but for an entire ecosystem. So wait, here's wait, a hold on. So 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 there is a lobster inside that striped bass. Yeah, that's just that's a lobster. That was from Raritan Bay. <laughs> that's crazy. So the lobster is worth more than the bass, maybe. Well, it's a and what you find them, eels used to be a tremendous fish for them, and we've done a very good job of destroying their eel fishery, whole eel population in North America, uh, is much less than what it was 30 years ago. Um, so now the fish, they got to feed on something else, a very opportunistic feeder. Now, when we were fishing the other day, it was just massive schools of bunker. So... This is bass number one. We slid its uh, stomach open, only had one fish. Now, that's pretty well digested. It's probably been for a day and a half or so. That's uh, probably about a 10-inch long bunker. 
So that was bass number one. Bass number two. See what those things are right here? Can you what still hear that? me? You see that? Yeah. What is it? What is it? Intestines. Intestines. That is not the stomach. That's actually egg cases. It's got two big egg sets here. This one had an empty stomach. <clears throat> but this is interesting because most of the fish we're catching are coming back down the river, already spawned. Well, here's one that's still going up the river that hasn't spawned yet. So huh. as an egg, that's pretty nice to know that we still got, you know, a couple more weeks of the season with this fish should be around as we still got fish going up the river as well as down the river. I found that very exciting as an angler who wants to get back out there and catch some more. And then here's bass number three. You can see that stomach was just really full of something. Look at that. That's about a 10, 11 inch bunker right there, also called Manhaden. That's what they're we're keen in on 100% for the most part over the weekend. There was just massive clouds of bunker, and there was, you know, uh, that was all we were fishing with. That we cast out, you set the hook, you snag. And one of those swimming circles till a bass comes and eats it. I should have thrown a picture here. We had a very unlikely uh, visitor. We actually had a humpback whale come by us. And this is all the way back in Perth Amboy, right by where the Raritan and the Arthur Kill come in. Very last spot I expect to see a humpback. But he was back there feeding too. I didn't check the stomach of him. <laughs> Good call. Good call. So we got the bunker. So we're trying to see, all right, so we know what the striped bass are eating. Well, now what has the, the bunker been eating? What has the manhaden been eating? Well, they're just a filter feeder. They just feed on all the phytoplankton and zooplankton. So they don't even really have a big stomach at all like the, you, most of your other fish have because all they eat is that plankton air stuff. So that right there is just stomach with a big, long intestine. And you can't tell what they're eating other than there's just all brown Brown poopy looking stuff. So you look at how the food chain works as fishery managers, you know, we got to look at not just the fish, but the entire fishery. So that same striped bass, as we looked at before, was eating lobster, was eating pipefish, was eating sea robins, was eating clams. Um, here, you know, this study here was probably a little further south uh, of here. We're talking about croaker, white perch, anchovy. So every one of these species you have to manage for at the same time as striped bass so striped bass is a fishery that they've been protecting pretty it's probably one of our most protected fisheries on the east coast yet you look at manhaden that's our number one uh, biggest fishery up and down the entire east east coast that's what i was just talking about called bunker that's actually used tremendously in pet food i think the i think the point he was going after there was that you know, yeah, we're we're managing for one thing, but if we're not concentrating on on really the the ecosystem as a whole, or you know, taking a, a, a closer look at the at the um, you know everything else in the food web, then you know we're we're really not not managing effectively uh, because you could say, all right, hey, listen, I've got. Uh, a, 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 a 28 inch limit on striped bass all right but if that bass doesn't have anything to eat well then that's that's a big problem all right so you know why is that important as a as a consumer well you know the uh, 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 the, the higher up the food chain um, the the greater the the bioaccumulation bioaccumulation is if you've got something, that is contaminating the algae and it happens to be uh, something that's able to dissolve into the fat that's going to end up in your atlantic blue tang let's say all right and that dissolves in that thing's fat then if that tang gets eaten by a black grouper okay uh, uh that gets dissolved and it ends up in that in that fish's fat okay so but that black grouper it doesn't eat just one tang right it's eating a whole bunch of them so what happens is is that these contaminants add up. Next thing you know, you've got a bluefin tuna, which ends up in you know the uh, the tin at the grocery store. It's eating a whole bunch of groupers. If it's eating a whole bunch of contaminated groupers, then well that's that's a really big problem uh, because if that if that uh, uh, contaminant is something that's that that is fat soluble, it's just going to keep just keep just adding up and adding up and adding up in that tuna. And guess who eats the tuna? 
you know, but but you and us at the grocery store. Uh, so this is something really important for fish and wildlife managers. You got to know what what your species is eating, and uh, 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 that that's pretty important because sometimes you just see some some unexpected things. Now, why is the stomach contents of a fish important for uh, uh, an angler? Well, uh, uh, like Mr. Griglack said, uh, 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 you've got, um, you know, uh, 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 if you know what it's eating at the time, then, you know, boom, uh, uh, now you know, you know, what to be casting out on your lines. If it's, uh, if it's going after that, that, that Manhattan, uh, then you want to have something out at the end of your line that looks like, uh, that looks like Manhattan. Uh, if they're going after, uh, after shrimp, well, you can probably put just about anything on uh, on the end of uh, 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 your line, and they'll be hitting that too. Uh, so uh, 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 that's that's why that's why that's important. All right. So so far we've been talking about saltwater fish, but unless you live at the shore or you spend an amazing amount of time at the shore, odds are you're going to be doing a lot more fishing in freshwater than saltwater. So. Let's talk about our uh, locally stocked friends, the uh, rainbow trout over here. What's he been eating? And uh, knowing Mr. Griglack, that's uh, either the Muskinetcong or the Pequest River right there. So uh, hopefully that's a large enough area we're not giving away his favorite fishing hole. All right, so uh, rainbow trout, um, you look inside their stomach. Odds are you're going to find uh, stonefly nymphs, mayfly nymphs or caddisfly nymphs. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, uh, little insects in various stages that they're going after, picking them off of the water. And, uh, you know, that's when you see them uh, hitting out there on those uh, pools on the rivers. Uh, so it's uh, uh, not a surprise that uh, 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 fly fishermen will use these flies that look a lot like uh, those nymphs that are found uh, in the uh, rainbow trout stomach. So here are a few examples. All right, and here's a, a few of those as, uh, as you see them out in, out in nature. Okay, uh, sometimes you get trout that, uh, that, that really aren't just, uh, they're really not smart, uh, and they're, they're hitting after everything. Uh, so you can put just about anything in the water, uh, including maybe uh, uh, food pellets or something that uh, they're being fed at the uh, hatchery, and uh, they'll, they'll hit on that as well. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, but sometimes uh, when, it, when you're out there and you're casting, uh, they're just not hitting on anything. So, uh, rainbow trout is one type of, uh, of uh, freshwater fish. It's certainly not the only one. Uh, right over here, uh, if anybody can, can tell what that is, well, uh, that's, that's, that's a monster right there. That is a monster smallmouth bass. And uh, knowing Mr. Griglack, that's up in Lake Ontario. Uh, that's a large enough area. Again, I hope I'm not giving away his, uh, his favorite fishing spot. So, uh, but, but what do they eat? What should you be going after uh, uh, in terms of uh, lures there? So how do, you, how do you find that out? Well, you check its stomach, stomach contents. And that one uh, right there, there was, a, uh, there was a shiner and there was a crayfish. Well, lo and behold, uh, they, uh, uh, there are plenty of lures out there that look like shiners and look like crayfish. Okay, but you can also make some general uh, some generalizations. Uh, so this particular fish, uh, the goby, which is an invasive species, it currently makes up about 89% of uh, smallmouth bass forage up on Lake Ontario. And uh, wouldn't you know it, they make lures that look just like that goby.